From Syria and Iraq to Sri Lanka, Egypt, Ukraine, and once again, Gaza and Israel. Accusations abound that human rights are violated. Headlines and sharp rhetoric about war crimes and crimes against humanity seem so common that they raise this question. Are we as a global society in fact making progress in protecting human rights because of higher awareness, or are we actually heading in the wrong direction? Perhaps no one is better equipped to answer this question than this woman, Navi Pillay, the highest official in the United Nations responsible for monitoring and investigating human rights abuses around the world. Describing herself as the moral voice that the world created to speak truth to power, she's approaching the end of her term. And when we meet up with her in her office in Geneva, she takes us on a tour around the world that offers little, if any, good news. Today, Navi Pillay talks to Al Jazeera. Navi Pillay, UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, thank you very much indeed. I'd like to start with Gaza, if I may. Um, the UN Human Rights Council has voted for an inquiry into what were called violations of human rights in Gaza. What can an inquiry like that achieve without the cooperation of Israel, which has already signalled that it doesn't want to cooperate with an investigation like that? Obviously, it would be much better if Israel cooperates, because this inquiry will examine all sides. Uh, violations on, on all sides and Israel has obviously complained about violations on the part of Hamas which they say provoked their self-defense operation uh, but if they do not give us access to their country we are well equipped to conduct these investigations uh, we've done it many times before more recently in DPRK uh, we have already done two such investigations uh, in my time at least, this was in 2009 and 2012, we were not given access there, the commissioners were not. But the information pours in and from Israel. To what extent do you hold Hamas accountable uh, for some of the things that have been going on there? I mean, they've, they've been putting uh, civilians at risk as well and Israel say that you'll, you go easy on Hamas. Well, I delivered a 15-page statement to the Human Rights Council and I said both sides were violating international humanitarian law and international human rights law, specifically the indiscriminate killing of civilians. International law is clear, you do not kill civilians. And But Hamas, is that, do, you, do, you, do you name them specifically? I uh, reported because we uh, have staff on the ground tracking these things in Gaza and Ramallah, and I've uh, reported 2,900 rockets and uh, mortar fired from Gaza by Hamas uh, just in, in, in a short period of a month. Um, uh, two years ago, I went to Sederat myself and saw these burnt out shells there, the shelters where children are forced to play indoors. So I see uh, people in civilians in uh, Israel, civilians in Gaza, children on both sides have a right to live. Tell me, if there is an inquiry that does find violations, um, without a referral to the International Criminal Court, what will it achieve? And we know that the US would probably block through its power of veto through the UN Security Council any referral to the ICC. Without that, what's the point of an inquiry? You know, there must be an inquiry. Let's, let's see the principle of the importance of justice for victims because this is a cycle that goes on and on, same patterns, and always it's civilians who pay the price. So therefore, there must be investigation. Uh, perpetrators must be identified. They must be brought to justice. It's true, your question, Lauren, is correct. We don't have an immediate justice mechanism that can address this. But all these investigations are factual records, and they'll be very useful one day, either for national prosecution or international tribunal. Cambodia was 20 years after the event, for instance. Israel has suggested that you may have prejudged the issue um, because of your strong message at the, at the Human Rights Council. Is that fair? Do you, have you prejudged it? I have not uh, prejudged it. I, you know, I have extensive judicial experience. I was an appeals judge on the International Criminal Court. So I assure you, I'm speaking to the legal framework. The legal framework that was created by all states and all of them have obligations 
to comply with. So I look at the law, I look at the criteria, which says you cannot have disproportionate killing, you have to provide a distinction between civilians and combatants, you cannot uh, bomb civilian homes, under, except under certain specific circumstances. So as I go through that checklist, I find that there's a violation pointing to the commission of war crimes and crimes against humanity. On that issue of, uh, of accountability and, and following the law, um, you've asked for the perpetrators of violations in Syria uh, to be referred to the International Criminal Court. Russia has already vetoed that move. Is there any hope for inter international justice with those kind of conflicts going on and, and not a prospect of, of the ICC's involvement? I am extremely disappointed that uh, my calls again and again to the Security Council, which is the highest authority and has the power to do so, to refer the situation of Syria to the International Criminal Court. And actually, my call has been picked up by very many states, at least 60 of them wrote, uh, he headed by Switzerland, supporting that call. Because the crimes and uh, the acts of violence and atrocities are at such an enormous level, no country should ignore that. You say you're disappointed. Are you frustrated? Do you think that actually the U UN High Commissioner's role, obviously you're, you're ending your tenure, but do you think that that role should have the power to refer to the ICC? Well, I'm not frustrated. The fact is it's only the Security Council that has the power to make such decisions or to make decisions about military intervention, sanctions and so on. My mandate is the protection and promotion of human rights. Therefore, I consistently bring these issues to the notice of, of authorities and states who can do something about it. In uh, Syria, has the territorial advance of uh, the Islamic State shifted the balance, do you think? I mean, is there, uh, are Western countries less likely to condemn what Assad is doing because uh, they also see what uh, Islamic State are doing, and it's also an, it's an extreme organization? Has the pressure shifted off Assad, do you think, because of what's going on with Islamic State? Well, I hope not. These are serious violations and um, many states, both in the Security Council and in the Human Rights Council and General Assembly, have condemned what is going on in Syria. Once again, in Syria, I've pointed to violations on both sides, on the part of the Assad government, their forces, and on the part of the uh, opposition groups uh, and the Commission of Inquiry has, has done a much more factually sound-based account of what's going on. Now, of course, recent events are alarming. This is one of the outcomes of huge conflicts, the spillover into other states. And, and this is what's happening, the Syria into Iraq. And so I'm deeply concerned about the situation. You mentioned the spillover into Iraq. On that very point, you, you've had a very recent um, report suggesting some of the the outrages that are being committed there. Can you give us a, a flavour of, of what you think is going on there and, and how bad it is? Well, my office, uh, jointly with the UN mission in Iraq, published this report of uh, very serious violations all around, the sectarian violations, um, violations against Christians, dislocation of uh, large numbers of Christian populations, and some of the hate speech uh, an ideology are simply frightful, that if you do not convert, you will have to leave. On that point, is, so Islamic State issuing those kind of ultimatums, is, um, is Christianity itself under threat in the region? Can it survive that? I think that Christianity is under threat, as it was in Egypt at one time too with the Coptic Christians there. It's my uh, work as High Commissioner for Human Rights to watch out for what we call minority groups. So Christians are minority groups in, in those regions, and I'm very alarmed about what is happening to them. I've been alerting to the rise of hate propaganda, which usually then leads to violence. One other topic, obviously, that's um, in the news a lot at the moment is, is Ukraine. It's perhaps taken some of these other subjects off, off the agenda. How worried are you about the escalation there and, uh, and what's going on on the ground and the kind of, you know, we've seen obviously a plane shot down. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, even as we speak, that there's a, a war going on there. The ICRC just named it as an internal civil war. We called it a conflict. Um, it was the, the Ukrainian government and the separatists uh, who, who appeared to be well armed 
we were able immediately to send 34 monitors on the ground. This is even before Crimea became a separate entity. And this is thanks to support, both moral and financial, from the Secretary General, who injected the funds in. And we've now about to publish a fourth report. There are, once again, very serious human rights violations on both sides. People are disappearing on both sides. Um, there, so there are detentions, there are killings, uh, especially women and children are affected. It's a fact that the, there's uh, no accountability for these disappearances that troubles me. Do you hold Russia responsible for some of this? Russia briefs me f uh, with information on their side. They're also very concerned because these are Russian-speaking separatists. But they feel the problem lies with some extremely right-wing, uh, what they call uh, Nazi uh, followers, pro-Nazi groups, who are responsible for the violence. So they are encouraging us as well to investigate this. And they insist it should be independent, impartial investigations. Are you concerned about what Russia has been doing? None of our evidence points directly to uh, a link to Russia. Uh, except that the, the separatists are Russian-speaking. They seem to have very easy access in and out of Russia. We're concerned about these very porous borders. If that's where killers and, and, uh, and well-trained fighters are coming across from the Russian border to eastern Ukraine, then I do feel that the responsibility lies with Russia to control those borders. I'd like to move on now to the topic of Egypt. Um, my Al Jazeera colleagues have now been in prison for more than 200 days. Uh, on the day of the verdict, you said that you were shocked and alarmed by the convictions. Since then, have you been, what have you been doing about it? What progress have you been able to achieve? Let me say I've issued statements not only about the three Al Jazeera journal journalists, because it's just shocking that they sentenced to seven and 10 years. Um, two years ago, I, uh, sent an extensive note verbal on what I thought was wrong with the protest laws. The uh, definition was too broad. And I'm appalled to see that now there is such a sweep. I understand that six journalists who were covering the Egyptian security forces activities uh, with regard to the pro-Muslim protests have been killed. Many more journalists are in custody. And uh, human rights activists, quite a large number, are in custody, have been sentenced on really spurious charges, uh, some to as uh, lengthy terms as 15 years imprisonment. And I've periodically written to point out where they're failing in observing international standards. What I'm doing is uh, working closely with the Egyptian government and I'm uh, they've invited me to establish a regional office there, and we want to go in. We're almost concluding that agreement. When we get in, we will be working on justice and transitional justice issues. Uh, so what is your message to them now? I mean, what, what do you want to see done about the kind of things like the, the maths death sentences and those big jailings? What, what, what do you want to see them do in the short term? I have said that the um, procedures were, fell far short of standards and was shocked that they can have such a large number of people in trial, most of them in absentia, and sentence them to death. Well, the process is still to come before the Grand Mufti. Any death penalty has to uh, go before them. I've addressed criticism both of the imposition of the death penalty uh, and, and secondly, that there should be proper trials but mainly about the law itself. If it's too broad, as I suspected it was, then it's open to abuse. I'm calling for the release of all these people because they were exercising their legitimate right of freedom of expression and assembly. And just briefly, on the, to go back to our Al Jazeera colleagues and media freedom, how important is it to, to protect that? It's extremely important. You know, I, I know from our work, OHCHR works very closely we depend on the media and civil society activists to provide us with, to alert us to situations. So journalists play a key important role and the, uh, there should be uh, international outrage from the public on how journalists are being attacked, uh, arrested, imprisoned, subjected to torture and so on. They must be allowed to do their work freely.
And briefly, is there any sign of progress since uh, al-Sisi became president as opposed to a military leader? Well, maybe I would mark it as some progress if we get to open our regional office there because it's taken some time to finalize the agreement. Um, I've been particularly pointed to, pointed to look, helping them with the judiciary. So clearly the executive uh, president Sisi's government sees uh, that there is a gap there that perhaps the judiciary is not uh, following on the lines of, uh, of uh, that the government wishes to set at least for justice and uh, fundamental freedoms. Uh, they have a long way to go, I would say, the new government. I'd like to take you now to Sri Lanka and this world tour. When uh, my colleague James Bayes interviewed uh, President Mahinda Rajapaksa in September last year, he called your, your report on the human rights situation there nothing but propaganda against Sri Lanka. How do you respond to that? These are several reports. The first one was done by the Secretary General's panel. It's true they're not investigations, they're facts. And these are facts said to very many people. There's a point of view on the part of victims. It's true the country is reconstructing, wants to move forward, but you have to address what victims are asking for. So I would totally reject the notion that it's propaganda and made up. These are facts mentioned to us, and again and again we placed it before them. Their own lessons learned uh, commission has produced almost the same facts, I should say. And uh, Sri Lanka was uh, urged by the council to implement the recommendations of your own LLRC, and they did not. On, on that point, you went to, to Sri Lanka on a fact-finding mission, and I think you, you found that while you were there, people were being harassed that you spoke to. Um, was that a low point in your tenure in the job? It certainly was, because people out of great courage sought means to communicate to us. One was a Jesuit priest, and all he was doing is documenting the uh, names of people who had disappeared. And surely this should be in the interest of Sri Lanka to address that. Instead, they did harass the uh, Jesuit priest after I'd left. They, the government, arranged for me to see a number of religious leaders. Amongst them was a, a, a Christian priest who stood up but then burst out crying. And he said to me in Tamil that he's just unable to say the things they want him to say. And this is a group that the government had got together. Uh, so it, wa it was appalling. It, it left me with the conviction that the people there really need international focus and international pressure. Does it get to you, the fact that you can have all the international pressure, you can write the reports, and then you still feel that your work is sort of rejected, if you like? Well, we have, for the very first time, had a, a, a UN body establish a, a, an investigation. So that has not happened before. So I believe, having learned lessons in South Africa, that you persist. Uh, there are many uh, falls along the way, but you can only have gains at the end of it because uh, we are the moral voice for what the United Nations stands for. It is there to protect civilians and victims. Now, on a slightly less, um, so perhaps the lives is a less obvious kind of human rights issue, but you were quite outspoken on the issue of the NSA and Edward Snowden. You said that he shouldn't be charged. Um, but I want to put a quote from uh, President Obama to you. If any individual who objects to government policy can take it into their own hands, uh, to publicly disclose classified information, then we will not be able to keep our people safe or conduct foreign policy. Does he have a point? When you, when you look at international law, there are two things here. International law protects the right to, to privacy, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the United States prescribes to those standards. So when do you protect the right to privacy? When do you uh, have incursions into that in the name of security? So we're calling for greater transparency. Will you tell us what's the criteria you, you are using? Usually, and this is my experience in, in, uh, when we tried uh, heads of government and, and ministers in the Rwanda tribunal, the information usually comes from insiders. And therefore, the public has to weigh the interests of disclosure against interests of non-disclosure. I just want to talk about your, your legacy, if you like, and you're coming to the end of this, um, this role. 
Um, critics have attacked you very personally at times, haven't they, in, in this job? Syria, after you said that um, crimes were sanctioned by the very top, m mentioning Assad, they, they, their response was to say that you were a lunatic uh, and people have called your pro reports propaganda. Do, do you think you are too outspoken? I mean, have you, have you crossed any lines when you look, look back? I'm quite satisfied that I have not crossed certain lines. Why? Because I'm trained to work within the law. This legal framework was created by all member states, so it would be different if I created my own standard and imposed it. I stayed within that mandate and I found that countries uh, were satisfied that I was fulfilling the mandate when I'm criticizing other countries in faraway places, but as soon as I pointed to uh, concerns in their own backyard, that's when they uh, have these personal attacks and so on. But, but, but you know, Lauren, it's the uh, entire world that created the position of High Commissioner for Human Rights. So they saw the need for someone to speak truth to power. And how much of the job is, you know, the megaphone stuff, naming and shaming, and how much of it is the diplomatic kind of back channels? What we, does one work better than the other, or do you have to do a bit of both? I do both, yes. Very, very often that, that letter, keeping quiet, has had someone rescued out of detention, torture stopped. Those are small gains. We have to do that. The Secretary General also does that. And actually, I don't see my uh, job as uh, naming and shaming. This used to be the old idea with the old Human Rights Commission. This Human Rights Commission has a system called Universal Periodic Review, where every state voluntarily submit their human rights uh, situation for review by their peers. And the principle is that we are then called to a system. This is what we are doing. We are a field base now. We have offices in 58 countries. We help states to change their laws, uh, to set up mechanisms to address torture and to strengthen civil society organisations. On that my point, I mean, you have to go through all the nitty gritty of these reports, quite often sort of horrendous abuses catalogued. And at the moment, we seem to have crises erupting everywhere, you know, Iraq, Syria, Gaza, we've talked about some of them. Is this one of the worst times ever for human rights, do you think? I'm getting close to agreeing with that, yeah. Here I was feeling quite proud about the achievements of our office, because we are aware of the advance of human rights um, and, and the uh, awareness all round, even inside the UN, everybody is now speaking of human rights and claiming these rights. So I feel that those are achievements, but in the appalling conflicts that are going on around us without solution, and they seem to be growing and growing, yes, I am dismayed about where we are. Do you ever kind of get depressed and think, make you lose your faith in humanity as a result of what you see? I think I... Uh, I uh, get deeply saddened that at, when, when any person is injured, particularly children. But this is an important mandate. I think uh, uh, actually that every person in the world can raise their voice and do something. But the High Commissioner for Human Rights can do so much more because he or she sits with the power to uh, raise awareness of these issues and to call attention uh, to them. And finally, so on that note, I'd like to ask you what, your, what you feel your biggest achievement has been in the job and your biggest failure. Well, I think the biggest achievement is the work of uh, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Um, with so many experts, we were able to advance the understanding of human rights everywhere. People really do understand. I like that we've addressed both uh, civil and political rights and economic and, and uh, social rights, the right to development. I've, I like that we focus on minorities everywhere. That includes um, migrants, women. I'm sorry to say they are minority. This is uh, what I feel are, are important, but I'm very aware that there are pushbacks, for instance, on reproductive rights of women, uh, the Committee on the Status of uh, Women, had problems with that. UN women had problems with, with the pushback. So achievements, but we have to be vigilant that there's no sliding back. The failures, I think that there's still so much impunity for violations across the world, and perhaps we should do much more to address these and speak, speak up for victims. Okay, Navi Pillay, thank you very much indeed uh, for talking to us here on Al Jazeera. Thank you.